Hi, Ron Legrand here. Before we get started with the podcast, I thought you might want to know that I recently recorded a 90-minute online training about how we make so much money today in the terms business. That's on pretty houses and pretty neighborhoods, not the junk houses that we have to go rehab or wholesale. I go through step-by-step on exactly what I and thousands of my students are doing right now to make the fastest and the easiest money in real estate without using your money or credit. If you're interested in doing just that, go to thementorpodcast.com forward slash free training. See you there. Welcome to the Mentor Podcast, where the most highly motivated entrepreneurs come to get their weekly dose of financial stability with host Ron LeGrand, as well as other nationally recognized thought leaders who will teach you how to get, grow, and protect your wealth. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Mentor Podcast. I'm Ron LeGrand, and beside me is Kurt Dixon. And Kurt is a student, actually, and just got a big check. And I think it's a good idea that we probably interview some of these folks to get these big checks and see what's going on in their life and how it compares to your life. And Kurt's a great example. In fact, he was at my last live boot camp we did here in Jacksonville. Sat in the back row, but as big as he was, I didn't have any trouble spotting him from the rest of the crowd. How are you doing, Kurt? I'm doing good, Ron. Good morning. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. What do you do for a living? And do uh, you have a family? And where do you live? Uh, currently, I well, now I'm doing real estate full-time. Um, I'm a single guy, but my family is originally from Jamaica, and um, I currently live in Austin, Texas, one of the hottest kind of craziest markets around right now. Um, and that's pretty much it, you know, just a just a you know average guy uh, living in Austin. What do you do for a living? Oh, oh, now I'm a full full time real estate investor. Okay, what were you? Uh, beforehand, I was doing a little bit of insurance, and then um, COVID hit, and then nothing. Yeah. Okay. So you uh, guys got a big check. Why don't you tell us about that? And uh, did that give you the uh, capital to uh, quit your job or did you already quit before you got that check? I'll quit before I got that check because COVID kind of helped that along. Oh, okay. Yeah. So just, you just sorry, did you quit or did they lay you off? Uh, pretty, pretty much I was laid off. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they did you a favor then, didn't they? Huh? Oh, they did. They did. They did. Um, so as far as the check goes, uh, that, that, that was a big deal. Um, I, it took me, I would say, roughly a le- little over 11 months to get it. I had a lot of pitfalls. I had um, deals come close, and I had to learn to discipline my disappointments because there's nothing like almost you know, getting a check and then in this market, there's somebody swooping in right behind me or their the seller's greed glands flare up, you know, whatever. That happens. Yeah. It's it's actually actually hot. In the hot market, the whole country's hot right now, but Austin truly is hot. I don't know that Austin's hotter than anywhere else, to be honest with you. Some of these markets are really uh, crazy right now. Craziest I've seen them. In fact, craziest I've seen in my life, but uh, I promise you it will turn. So if you can get checks in this market, wait till we get into the good markets coming up because we're definitely going to have a downturn. I, I don't know when. I don't have a crystal ball. But if you crack this code now, it's going to be shooting ducks in a barrel when the market slacks down some. So tell me about this deal. Um, it's on a single family house. What's the deal? Yeah, so uh, this house came from a handwritten bandit sign. And um it was the, the handwriting, handwriting was so bad that I was almost not going to put him out because every time I looked at it, I was like, no, can anybody read this? This is ugly. I felt like a kindergartner wrote it. I really did. Um, oh, and, wait, stop, stop right there. You know how long I've been preaching and ugly out pulls pretty? Long time. So ugly, it forced you to keep staring at it to figure out what it was saying, right? <laughs> it, it was bad. All, all 14 were bad. <laughs> Yeah. Could you honestly tell me then that if that was one of them store bought and signs, you probably wouldn't even give them a second notice? Yeah. I mean, as far as as far as like me looking at it and, and taking it. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I would I would looked at it, but I'd have been like, man, a three year old wrote that. Well, that was the whole point, actually, because you immediately came to the conclusion this seller really isn't all that sophisticated. and probably not going to be a threat to you, probably not any smarter than you. Is that false? 
that is that really what you were thinking? Oh yeah, when I, when I, I, w- I would think that they're gonna take me seriously with this handwriting versus my other signs that are printed. Yeah, okay. All right, well, that's good. That's a lesson that you need to remember going forward. So, you know, when I tell people that ugly sounds out full pretty ones, they have a hard time understanding why, but uh, I'm glad you brought that up because now we know why. It just attracts your eyeballs. You can't take them off of it. You got to stare at it. You see what it says. And you said you couldn't hardly read it, huh? Yeah, in fact, um they they were actually some leftover bandit signs. I had a total of 25 of them. And uh, ultimately, there were 14 left over. So I rewrote it so many times that only 14 survived out of the 25. Huh. Okay. All right. So you did that on purpose. <laughs> oh, well, I was trying I was trying to get my handwriting better because, uh, you know, it's, it, it was so uh, ugly. I was like, no, 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 you can't put this down here. Maybe, maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tell us about the deal. What did you pay for the house? Uh, so... It was 189 was the was the um was the uh the final payoff amount, but I ended up selling it for 272. I was gonna initially do a uh assignment of contract because the sellers didn't want any money out of the deal, but I ended up doing a double close because it would have been eighty three thousand dollar check that I've gotten. But I didn't want the greed gland to flare up. Well let's go back. You bought it for what he owed on it, one eighty nine. Yes. Okay, so you put it under contract to buy it and take over his debt. No, actually, uh, they hindsight being twenty twenty, if I was, you know, I could have probably done that, but they didn't weren't comfortable with it. So mm-hmm. they, we don't want our name on it, um, which I wish they did because it would have been a great, it would have been a cash cow, I believe. Um, yeah. So they said, you know, we just want to pay it off out of our hair. Right. We're done with this. So that's what so I you did. You put it under contract for all cash then. Yes, I did. Okay. Did that scare you a little bit knowing you didn't have the cash? Uh, a little bit, but what scared me more was the fact that um, when I realized that, okay, I know what they said about not wanting any money, but uh-huh. I knew if I did a uh, assignment of contract, they would see an $83,000 assignment fee. And then when I found I had to do a double close, that freaked me out because that was completely like throwing me a pool into a pool I never swam in before. And that freaked me the hell out. Well, for the sake of our listeners now, let's catch up. You put it under contract, all cash, because the seller wouldn't let you take over their debt. You knew yes. it was worth a lot more money, didn't you? Yes. Did you know how much it was worth at that time? I did, but it c- turns out because of this market, I was well below what it was really worth. Yeah. So you, you thought it was worth, I don't know, what do you think, 250 maybe? No, it was worth 360 I mean, what do you mean? It was 189 Yes. 289. No, he'll, 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 he'll 189, but. Okay. And you sold it for two, what? Two, 272. So, well, where did 360 come from? What was, was that? That was the R. Oh, so you sold it way under R. Oh, but, yeah. But even, even, even well below that, because by the time I sold it, um, the R was, had gone up to about 380, almost 400. Wow. So the buyer got a hell of a deal, too, didn't he? Oh, he did because he didn't balk at it. Or you sold it too cheap too, didn't you? Yeah. In fact, uh, at the event, I think I told you that uh, the next day, a guy from California who I talked to initially was like, "Hey, remember you know the house you talked about? I'll give you about three hundred thousand for it." And I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> that one day, I was. I, I mean, what could I do? I couldn't renege, but I was just like, one day, that was thirty thousand dollars more. <laughs> what did, what should you have done looking back, or man, I, I don't know. I guess be more patient. <laughs> you know? uh, uh, all right, look, I know you had a, a great deal. You yes. put a contract, so kudos for that. But you could have just got a private loan on it and funded it and closed it yourself, and then put it on the market retail to an owner occupant got full retail price out of it. Yeah, I I I am painfully aware of that. <laughs> So did the house need work? Not as much. Yes, it did. Uh, the seller thought it needed one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars worth of work. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it, but it didn't. I mean, even with after the mold, after the mold uh, protocol, which gave the work to be done, and just the basic stuff that need need to be done in the house, uh, I would say about 
35, maybe 40, 50 would be really pushing it. I mean, I mean, I'm talking about really pushing it. Um, you already been to my boot camp, so you were better equipped to estimate those repairs. Oh, actually, yeah. In fact, I, I want to give you, give you, you know, a big gold star in that one because before before I went to the boot camp and understood the um, the repairs, I used to give these low ball offers because I was um, well, I'll shoot myself in the foot because I would grossly overestimate the repairs because yes. I didn't understand. Yeah. So you're giving low offers accordingly, not getting anything bought. Not, yeah. In fact, I, I got a lot of angry people. Okay. So. There's two very important key ingredients that I'm hearing. Number one, you were able to estimate the R on it, even though it went up quick. Most people grossly underestimate the R. They, they look at the Zestimate on Zillow and think that's the R. You knew it needed work, but you knew it didn't need a fraction of what the seller thought it needed. Mm -hmm. so the seller didn't know what the value was, and the seller didn't know what the repairs were. Mm -mm. The seller was happy to get out just for what they owed to get the loan out of their name. So yeah. they, they, they got what they wanted. So you yeah. get your contract. All right. When you were putting it under contract, what were you thinking about how you're going to get out of this thing? <laughs> well, when, when when they signed, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, as they were signing it, you know, it's been it's been by then it was about 10 months. I was hunting for deals. I was waiting for Murphy to slap me in the face right there and then because I couldn't believe they're actually signing the paperwork when to buy their house at that price. And I was waiting, waiting, waiting. I was like, OK, they're going to object to something. And then. Um, when the wife looked at the paperwork, hold on, don't sign that yet. I was like, okay, here it comes. This is, this is going to die right here in the vine. Um, she, 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 she looked at it for five minutes. And I don't think she really knew what she was looking at, but she said, okay, yeah. you can sign this now. And I was like, oh. Well, it was an all cash, all, all cash sale. What was there to look at her crying out loud? I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's just people. But when, once they signed, uh, then I thought to myself, okay, you know, this is this wasn't this wasn't what I wanted in the sense of you know maybe taking over subject two or doing owner yeah. financing, but now yeah. I gotta go find buyers. Okay, so how long did you give yourself on the contract to close? Uh, I wasn't a time constraint. All I could give myself was really thirty days because um, I found out that uh, they were in forbearance, and I gave myself thirty days because right after that, there were, the bank was going to accelerate the loan. Well, they might be going to accelerate it, but it still takes them a long time to get it called due and get it to the, get it to the, uh, well, that's probably why the seller was happy to get out of it for what they owed on it. They were about to lose it anyway. So you did them a huge favor. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make a point here. You didn't save their credit. Some people, I hate when people use that term. If they were about ready to foreclose on them, their credit was already lost. Okay. They, Main, I mean, their credit, it wasn't as bad as when, they it, when the bank filed the foreclosure because that would go on their credit immediately as well. They already had multiple late payments on their credit. So you didn't save your credit, but you did save the house from foreclosure. So um, honestly, when you put this thing under contract, you had to be in this. You had to be where the hell am I going to get this money at? Now, what have I done on this deal? It was kind of thoughts creep in. <laughs> uh, they did. In fact, um... I was thinking to myself, uh, well, I was, I was, but I had one thing in the back of my mind. Uh, now that I actually had uh, a potential, I had a contract. I was wondering, is this market going to be hot enough to where I can actually, you know, make more money in this thing? Because the two seventy two wasn't my starting price at all, not far from it. What was it? I would have been okay with two thirty. Well, how'd you get two seventy two? Did you name the price? Well. I called. I called about five different people, and then um, two two of them showed up at the same time at the, at the place, and they both found out what the other one was willing to pay, and then there was a bidding war. Oh, that's good. It, it was yeah, I, but I should I should like I said I should have waited one day. However, the the, the last the the guy who lost out, um, you know, he, he said two seventy two. No, I can't do that, Kurt. Because I feel like you're shopping me around. I said, I'm not. And he, and he said, you know what? I'll tell you what. Last offer, I'll give you 270 And I'll pay, you know, I'm like, oh, okay. The other guy was 272 I was like, I'll get back to you. So the other guy had skid marks coming to meet me. Let's today, Kurt, come sign this today. <laughs> but hindsight being 2020, they would have probably paid more. Well, sure. They probably would have all paid more. You had a big spread in it, though. I mean, it was plenty of investment. Yeah. So... How did you go about finding these buyers? Um, 
I had I had an initial buyers list of um, because I'm part of a local real estate investment group, mm-hmm. and um, even some and these guys weren't really part of my group. It's just some people I met along the way. Yeah. Um, even people in my own group, I hate to say they were trying to lowball me. Some of, some of them were like, "Yeah, we can give you two twenty. but by then I was like, "No, you're not quite close enough." Yeah. And, I, and even even when I sold it, um, I didn't say anything to my group until um, one of the calls. Hey, Kurt, how did that deal go? And you know, I told them. They're like, "What? They paid what? They couldn't believe it because they know how much I got it for." And they're yeah. like, "Someone paid for that price?" And I was like, "Yeah, they did." And uh-huh. that's okay. okay. So these guys were outside of it. In fact, uh, they were they're not even part of my group, and they just you know they buy houses, so they were they were okay with the price, and you know they got a really good deal. Now, now, well, listening to you, I'm about to change the rules that, uh-huh. that I made. I made them. By golly, I can change them, right? <laughs> okay. Up until this extremely hot market we're in right now, I always name the price when I'm putting the house on the market. But um, what if you just had an open house one day, hour, and just talk, called all you about potential buyers? Say, look, I'm going to be showing this house between this and this, and the highest bidder to, to, that comes in today is going to get the house. Oh, that'd have been good. <laughs> one hour, come take a look at the house. Just write, tell me what your highest bid is. Highest bidder gets it. It's just that simple. Oh, that 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 would have been that would have been beyond good. Of, you know, cons- I would hate to say people's greed glands and competition with the flare up, but it. it, it, uh, it, it yeah. <laughs> in fact, you could even put a minimum bid on it if you wanted. Uh, I remember back when times weren't so good. We used to do that. We sell houses, pretty houses. We bring them into an open house. We leave the pad right there at the door. Let them bid. Everybody can see the bid. You know, mm-hmm. put a starting bid on it. You can always put a starting bid on it, but it should be low. So they think they can come in and steal the house. (laughs) I'm I'm, going to lay this out for everybody listening. So they just put their bid on there, and and, uh, you've got to capture their phone number now and their name. Uh, I don't know if I want want that where everybody can see it right on the sheet. You're just just letting everybody steal your buyer's list from you. (laughs) (laughs) I just put your name and your highest bid, and then I get them to capture their phone number. Uh, and their name on a, on a little card when they come in, uh, when they come in and uh, put right up there. Uh, put your highest bid now before you leave. I will call everyone at three o'clock this afternoon and put you all on a conference call and then the highest bidder at that time will get the house. Uh, I am serious. And it's open, it's clear open. They're on a conference call, everybody's here and everybody else bids. So you're doing a minute a min- an auction that takes an hour and one phone call to do. Uh, that's just a million dollar idea there. I have one. Of I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow that. Yeah, you do that. I'd like to see you do that on your next deal and tell me how it works. Actually, it's already in my head. <laughs> so anyway, you uh, put you went out and you contacted some buyers you already knew or thought they were buyers you really didn't know. Mm-hmm. They went and looked and they told you what they'd pay. Did you give them a number when you sent them to the house? Uh, no. No. You just I remember. tell you what they would pay. Yeah. Which is kind of like my one hour deal just dragged out over a few days, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, by, by the way, all these people that come look at the house, now you're capturing your information. Now you've got your buyers list as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you don't have to run ads or any of that crap. You just, once you get that buyers list, which you can do on your first deal, like you did. Now, now let them come and your buyers just build that. Now you know they're real because they took the time to come out and take a look at the house. Yes. In fact, I'd get me a little, uh, if you'll go to buy a uh, quick start uh, MLS uh, manual, uh, quick start manual, you'll find a little sheet in there designed for potential wholesale buyers. And to just ask them, uh, what's the uh, highest price you're looking for? How fast is there any particular area of town? That kind of thing. Just get that little sheet filled out when they come in the door. And they, they don't even have to stay there an hour. You're just there for an hour. They mm-hmm. kind of look around, put down their bid and leave. But, they, like but you need to capture their information now as they come in. So even if they don't have a bid, you can put them on the buyer's list. Okay. All right. Uh, and knowing that they're going to be called at 3 o'clock, you put them on a conference call. Well, actually, I could, I could give them the conference call number right then and there. Mm-hmm. Right then and there. And say at three o'clock, we own this conference call. If you want to 
if you if you are interested in uh, topping the bid, or even if you're not. All right. Okay. I'd say I'd tell you what the high bid is on the conference call at three o'clock, and you can decide whether you want to up it or not. <laughs> so we, just, we just built a system here, talking, listening to you now. So you're going to get credit for it. All right. So, uh, what happened when you found the buyer? Uh, and you did this double close now. That means you actually closed on it first, and then you resold it to the buyer. Well, it was all what that for just to keep the seller from finding out how much money you're making? Oh, without question, because I, I, I remember from like listening to you, um, what, what you're saying is basically what people intend to do is, is different than what they actually do, right? So they said, oh, Kurt, we don't care about the money and yada, yada, yada. And I thought to myself, okay, imagine I'm at the closing table. Hey, what's this 83,000 for? You know, and yeah. that, that could have that could, that really turned, you know, that could have been... You probably did the right thing, especially in Texas, we have almost no closing costs. Yeah, the closing costs are cheap. Yeah. So how did that work? Your title company, did you close with a title company? I, I did, but the, the problem that I, that I encountered was I ended up having to get a hard money guy uh, to do transitional funding. Yeah. You know, so the title he, company wouldn't take the buyer's money and use it to close? They would, but my my end my end my end buyer wouldn't allow his funds to be used to uh, to. Uh, Your end buyer would have no idea what's happening to his funds. There's a confusion there somewhere. The end buyer sends the money to the closing agent at the closing agent's request. What happens beyond under that is you know, end buyers none of your their business. So somebody opened their mouth and said something stupid here. Oh, that might be me. No, it might be you. Okay. <laughs> Next time you shut up, all yeah. you have to do is tell your end buyer, the closing agent will be contacting you, and then you'll get the money to them, all right? And mm -hmm. they don't have any idea that the closing agent is then taking their money and using it to close and then cutting a check for the difference for you. And what do they care anyway? Buyers should care less. <laughs> okay. uh, um, it's, it's Some states have a rule against that, some don't. I don't know about Texas. But mm -hmm. you use transactional funds, what that cost you? Well, it was supposed to cost me two percent, but um, turned out he 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 already knew the buyer was selling to, so he hated this guy, and uh, so even though he charged me two percent at closing, <clears throat> he cut me a check later on for one percent back. So, all right. So, transactional funding for our listeners is somebody that just puts up the money, but it never leaves the closing table, and it cannot be used to fund the deal. And so he got two points. Just for sending the money to the closing agent and closing agent sending it back after closing. Yeah. Okay. But that was totally unnecessary, most likely. Probably, yes. So how much was two points on that deal? Uh almost almost four thousand. No, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Almost four thousand. Yeah. yeah. That cost more than my boot camp, didn't it, Kurt? It 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 did. It did. I mean, I, to be honest, I, I should you know. 80, uh, it would have been a lot. <laughs> it, I, I went from 83 to 71. So it cost me money for, for double closing costs. It did. Didn't you have a mentor at that time? Yeah, I did. Who? Andrew. Didn't you discuss this with Andrew? I, I did. Um, but it got kind of convoluted with the title company. So I wanted to get it done quickly. So I, I went ahead and got it. But man, I'm telling you right now, that, that transactional funding money was a waste of money. You just didn't. I won't do it again. I mean, look, I'd have talked to the title company for you. The title company was not your problem, I don't think. No. Because they can either do it or they can't do it. But uh, most states, they can do it. They're an issue with it. Uh, anyway, enough on that. So um, you did all this virtually, right? Uh, actually, no. They, 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 the uh, what well, you mean? Well, I meant the, the uh, seller was all always in person because they were very much. Uh, I mean, the closing. The closing. It could, it could have been, but I, I, uh, I went. It was half and half because I went with my seller to the closing, but the end buyer, all that, the end buyer and my transitional funding was all done virtually, but. I could have done everything virtually, but the, the seller was kind of, they're kind of different people because they want to do everything in person. So I went, yeah. with, I well, went with, 
All right, all right. You got to do what you got to do. I think he did the right thing there. Went and made sure there was no issues. On the other hand, when you're selling something cash, uh, there ain't a whole lot to argue about. <laughs> okay, so, so the seller did, did never did find out what you sold it for, did they? No, they were, ha they were happy though. It was out of their hair. Yeah, I'm sure they were. So how long did it take you to get a contract to, buy, to sell it after you put the contract on it to buy it? About five days. I mean, but no, four or five days, give or take. I think it was five days. Okay. And then how long did it take you to close it after that? Oh, uh, well, that was that was that that was a problem. There was there was a backup. I would say it took me 27 days total to get from start to finish because the title company ran into a situation where they were having trouble getting the title reports back because the cities had so many sales that it's backlogged them. It's, it took them almost three weeks. I was like, man, you're killing me here, you know? Yeah. But they, yeah. they they pulled it out in the end, though. Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, your seller would have extended it anyway if they'd known you. Yeah, they would have. They would have. Okay. All right. So you said it took you 11 months to get this deal done, but it only took you a few days to do the deal. Yeah. So why did it take you so long to get that deal going? Oh uh, man, a combination of things. Just well, the first of all, just being new in the sense of um, going through going through the calls for sure. A um, lot, a lot of mistakes on my part. Um, talking to a lot, of, talking to a lot of as you call them suspects, yeah. trying to make your prospects when they were, you know, when they were have no intention of even taking me seriously about buying their house. So I spent too much time on those people and also had a, you know, my signs were getting taken down consistently. Um, but what, what the turning point was, was the quick, was a live quick start that was before the, the previous, it was a March, right? I talked about, yeah. 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 March, yeah. yeah, yeah March. So I, ta I talked, I talked to some of the mentors and I asked them, Hey, you know, what, what can really take students out? And they said two things, not getting on the phone and not um, getting the phone and getting better over time and not generating leads. So I took that to heart. So when I got back home, I said, OK, I'm going to focus on making my calls, getting better and generating leads. And um, it paid off because I, I quit. I quit looking at all the you know, road bumps that hit. And I said to myself, OK, I can either quit or I can keep going till I succeed. So. I basically kept going, and I, even even if I didn't get that deal, I would have kept going because I knew you said something in the in, in the last in the previous quick start. You know, if I think I can't do a deal in my my own city, ask yourself how are other people doing deals. Yep. So, and I thought to myself, yeah, well, why can't I do that? It's like keep yep. going, and I got a deal. Yeah, well, you found the right kind of seller. Seller was in trouble, and the house needed repair. That always is a good combination. Mm -hmm. And you, you found them because the seller contacted you, which is always the best kind of seller, those who call you. And you put out some cheap road signs, and, and that's, that's, that's the way the business works. So um, along the way, what you're saying is you learned a lot of lessons, uh, and your biggest issue was handling the call. It took you a long time to get around that, master that. Uh, and uh, you also decided that you were going to push forward, which a lot of people don't, Kurt. You know, we've got to... Got to hand it to you. People are looking for a reason to quit, and there's plenty of them out there. Mm -hmm. And the check you got is more than most people make in an entire year working. And, you know, you guys listening to this right now, you better ask yourself, what do you do now for $71,000? You probably show up to work every single day, five days a week, all those weeks out of the year, and devote all your time and swap all those hours for dollars. And in fact, uh, Kirk got it out of one deal. So it's, you're just a great example of how one deal can easily uh, create a year's worth of income. And they ain't all gonna make $71,000, but on the other hand, some of them will make more. And yours was a cash deal, okay? You were looking for terms, you were making terms calls, but the seller, when they gave you the information and the, and the amount of repairs it needed, it turned into a, a cash deal, and you had the flexibility to recognize that opportunity and put it under contract for all cash, or you'd have lost the whole deal. It would cost you seventy-one thousand dollars. It probably would have cost you more than that, Kurt. Probably would have cost you a whole career. 
because sooner or later you would have made the decision it's not going to work, not going to work in Austin. Austin's too hot. I'm just going to quit and go do something else, which a lot of people do. So congratulations, sir. You did. So now you all, now you got a taste of blood. So now nobody's going to talk you out of it. So what are you going to do going forward? Oh, well, I'm going to continue putting out my road signs. Um, I've increased now, now that I have the money, I uh, increased my marketing. I'm utilizing my VA more. Um, so I'm going to have her call lists or my VAs call lists. And I'm just going to keep pushing forward. I'm going to actually increase my, my, my road signs and just um, working with Andrew. I'm looking at different marketing to fit my budget because one thing I'm, I've learned is I'm not going to blow my money. I'm not no. going to go there and buy cars and all that stuff. No. <laughs> well, not only that, don't blow your money wasting it on advertising that you haven't tested first. Have you talked to Andrew about running some paid Facebook ads, which is his main way of finding deals? Uh, yes, uh, I, I did. Um, and I told him what my budget was, and he said, okay, you know, it's going to cost a bit more. So you yeah. can work your way into it. So I'm, I'm working with him to just basically fit my budget because um, – it's a, it's, a, it's a big chunk of money, but you're right. I don't want to just start throwing money at it, at stuff, and then, you know, no. burn some cash. Well, putting out signs works. Do you have um, do you have uh, free ads running on various sites? Uh, I had stuff on the Craigslist, but I also, I also do have um, vehicle signs. In fact, I have my vehicle sign, and I have three other friends that I put I buy houses cash in the back of their vehicles. So to, I have a total of five cars out there roaming around. Are they getting any calls? They, they do. It's it's not it's not as abundant as uh, the road signs, but they do come in. They're not as abundant. But how many of the calls do you need in a year? For crying out loud! I mean, nobody's doing anything. You put a sign on the back of the car one time and they're done. Just drive. Yeah. What are you paying them uh, for the calls? Uh, so I, I gave them ten dollars per lead that actually not the call, but they actually leave them leave a message with the house, and then if I buy the house, I'll pay them two fifty. Okay, just like in the book, huh? Exactly. Here's a tip: send them ten bucks every now and then, whether you get a lead or not. Oh yeah, I, I actually have done that already. You know, oh, very good. Just keep them in the game. Yeah, make them think that, that you're killing it on their on, on, on their leads. You won't get a lot, but ones you get are good ones. People yeah. call off the sign on the cars. That's a very good call, just like off the sign on the side of the road. So you're doing the right stuff, very inexpensive stuff. Uh, okay, well, keep it up. And um, uh, we've been talking to you. You're an inspiration to to our group. So oh, thank you. Uh, can't wait to hear from you about your next deal. Oh, yeah. Well, I have, I have a big goal, for, you know, so – I'm looking. My goal is seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, not including my non-refundable deposit. So I'm a push. Okay. Do you have that goal lined out on how you're going to get to it? Yeah, I have a rough draft of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh Oh, uh oh. You need to know exactly how you're going to get to it, what time frame, and what's going to happen by when. Okay, and I need to refine it then. Those short-term goals turn into task lists that go right into your planner or wherever. So you get stuff done to reach that goal every single day or you'll never get there. Okay. You say, I'm going to make a million bucks next year. Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> when? What's got to happen between now and this time next week, next month, so forth? Lay it all out realistically so you can believe what you're writing. Yes. And then start popping a little, you eat the elephant one bite at a time. I agree. And, um, you know, it's just as easy to shoot for a million and get halfway there as it is to shoot for half and make it. <laughs> <laughs> Never know. You might trick yourself into believing you can make it. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You remember Jay Connor? Yep. How much, how much did he make his first year? Ooh, I don't know. Seven figures. Oh, okay. Remember the Wolves? Yes. Seven figures. Wow. I know that. Is it a different time? Granted, just the same. What's so special about them? Not much. I mean, they're special now, but they weren't special when they started. I was there, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So go anyway. Go out there and kill it. Keep it. Yeah, you're fun to talk with. I enjoyed it. I appreciate it. I thank you, Ron. You have a good day. All right. Now, listen, guys. If you're watching this, and it's maybe your first one, first of all, you can go on our 
on our site, thementorpodcast.com, and download a whole lot of podcasts on about any subject you can think of. And don't forget, you can go to ronlegrand.com forward slash terms, T-E-R-M-S. Go in there and watch an hour and 15 minute uh, online presentation on how we do this, how we do this terms business. I think you'll really see, it lights you up to change your attitude about real estate. I can tell you that. Show you what we do in the real world out there. All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you, Ron. Have a good day. Go, go get some more deals. I will. <laughs> I want I want one under contract by the end of next week. Yeah, I'll push for it. Okay, uh, it's a challenge. Push, push for my eye. I say I want to get a contract by the end of next week, and I don't want it to be fake either. Uh, oh, you you'll never get a fake contract from me, never. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. See ya. Thanks, Rob. Bye. That's all for this edition of the Mentor Podcast. To connect with Ron and learn how you can attain financial freedom, as well as up-to-date strategies to grow and protect your wealth based on today's discussion, go to www.connectwiththementor.com.